Hi there, and welcome back to our next lecture in our Microbiology for Surgical Technologists book. This is going to be covering Chapter 7, and Chapter 7 is about microbial genetics and mutations. So we're going to be talking about mechanisms by which cells pass on traits. We'll describe the structures and appearance of DNA in humans. We'll take a look at that. We'll compare and contrast natural and artificial transformation. And then we'll finish up by talking about the roles of various mutagens and genetic mutations. Working in the healthcare field, we're exposed to a lot of different um, potentially hazardous uh, chemicals and carcinogens and mutagens. And uh, so it's important for us to understand the concept associated with those uh, mutagens and also how to protect ourselves when we're exposed to them. An example I've talked about before is the ethylene oxide that we use for sterilization of those things that cannot withstand the heat that steam sterilization provides. So uh, the ETO sterilizer has been shown to be a carcinogen and a mutagen, and so many hospitals have stopped using that. Uh, in addition to that, we are exposed to higher levels of gamma radiation because we have x-rays and fluoroscopy machines that come into the operating room. And so it's important for us to know um, how to protect ourselves by wearing lead aprons and thyroid shields and those types of things. So an awareness of the exposure potential plus what protective mechanisms we can use to minimize the risk is really important uh, for the job that we do as surgical technologists. So by now we're probably all familiar with Gregor Mendel. He was the father of the study of genetics and he worked with pea plants. And he determined that his little pea plants had genotypes and their genotypes uh, determined their phenotypes, what they were gonna look like, right? So um, each living organism has a complete set of genes and this is referred to as their genome. All right, um, so several genomes have been mapped for bacterias as well as us, Homo sapiens, right, with the Genome Project. And um, so more than 180 species of microbes have been sequenced just since 1995. And it's a lot easier to map the genome of a bacteria because they're a lot less complicated than we are, right? They're more simple creatures. They have a shorter lifespan. They're easier to study and to map. So remember, each gene segment of DNA has a special code that codes for a specific protein. And some are single strand, some are like the human DNA, which is a double helix. Now humans have 46 chromosomes. That means they have 23 uh, pairs, 22 of them being identical and that third pair being the X and Y. And we have five bases, five different nitrogenous bases that are the building blocks of our DNA. And those are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thiamine. And they link together, T's always pairing with A's, and C's always pairing with G's. Now, we have um, a lot more uh, base pairs than, let's say, a bacteria does. And uh, scientists use some specific terms to talk about these numbers of bases. And a kilobase is going to be a thousand base, uh, bases. And a megabase refers to a million bases. So E. coli, for example, that lives in our digestive tract has approximately 4.6 megabase, megabases. Humans, on the other hand, have about 3,000 megabase pairs. And uh, so here you just are uh, getting a look at the Punnett square that uh, Mendel used to um, use genotypes to determine from mom and dad 
uh, to determine what the probability of offspring would look like with a specific genotype. And that genotype is going to represent what that offspring may look like. Bacteria use one of four methods to transfer genetic material, and that is conjugation, transduction, transformation, and lysogenic conversion. We're going to talk about each of those in more detail, but bacteria are similar in the way uh, they reproduce um, to the way that humans' uh, sex cells reproduce. Uh, in that they use this form of like shuffling of the genetic information and humans use something called crossing over bacteria use something called recombination so recombination is that key feature of genetic transfer among prokaryotes and it enables them to form a new combination of genes by either natural or artificial means The process of conjugation is completed by specialized plasmids called conjugative plasmids. And these plasmids are able to transfer themselves to another bacterial cell. And a really common one that is well known and understood by scientists is the F plasmid. And this F plasmid is special to E. coli bacteria that grow in our digestive tract. So the F plasmid um, encodes for at least 13 genes and bacterial cells that have the F plasmid are called F positive and those that do not have it are called F negative. So one of those um, genes that the F plasmid encodes for is something called a sex pilus or an F pilus. And what happens is this pilus that the F plus bacteria has allows it to attach to another bacteria, to another E. coli bacteria. And once it attaches, the pilus retracts and the two cells now become connected to each other. There's a pathway between the two. And what's going to happen is that F positive cell, the plasmid is going to copy itself and then it's going to leave the F positive cell and go into the F negative cell. And when this happens, that F negative cell becomes an F positive cell. Now, the initial F positive cell is still going to remain F positive because that plasmid may have made a copy of itself before it left. So we're still good. Now we have two F positive cells here. Now there are other plasmids, uh, and the book gives an example of the R plasmid that transfers in a similar fashion, and some of them are referred to as being promiscuous, which means that they will trans, they will put their sex pilus into any cell that gets near them and transfer information into them. Uh, so the F plasmid isn't like that. It's, it only likes E. coli cells, but there are other plasmids that really don't care and, uh, uh, an example is um, there are some promiscuous plasmids that are transferred among most of the gram negative bacteria species and, uh, you know, genetic information is just being transferred back and forth, which leads to the um, their ability to be able to change and adapt and morph and have um, these multiple um, abilities to withstand uh, antibiotics and become resistant and, and all of these things. It is really quite interesting. Transduction is the transfer of a portion of DNA from one bacteria to another by bacteriophages. And bacteriophages are viruses that infect bacteria. 
And so you can see in this little diagram here, the bacteriophage is going to lock on to the bacteria and it's gonna insert some DNA in there, the phage DNA, right? And then it's going to start replicating itself and eventually it is going to cause lysis or rupture of the cell and all of those little bacteriophages are going to go skipping about and they are going to lock on to other bacteria and invade them with the new recombination of DNA. And then this process just continues over and over again. Now there are two types of transduction because there are two types of bacteriophages that are produced during transduction. And those are virulent phages and temperate phages. Virulent phages attach to the bacterial cell wall and inject their DNA into, the, uh, into it to infect the cell. Then this part of DNA begins to control the cell and make more of that DNA and protein. So those two components are going to combine into a mature phage, and that's what's going to be released from the host cell, and it can now latch on to other bacteria and do the same thing. Now, one in 100,000 times a mistake occurs. And what happens is that phage ends up combining with some of the bacterial cells DNA. So not only is it just the viral phage, the, the virulent phage, but it also um, takes on part of the bacteria's DNA. So now you have like this hybrid virus that has part of the bacteria's DNA. And so when, um, when so many of those virulent phages are produced that it causes the bacterial cell to lyse, then those bacteriophages are going to attach themselves to other bacterias and insert that recombinant DNA. That's this hybrid of whatever bacteria it came from and the virus DNA. So this has been found to occur in Streptococcus, Staphylococcus, Salmonella, and Vibrio cholerae. Now, aside from virulent phages, there's temperate phages. And temperate phages have two life cycles, the lytic cycle and the lysogenic cycle. And during the lysogenic cycle, the bacteriophage DNA is latent. It's inactive. It's not doing anything. This is called the prophage. And so some are plasmids, and they're just kind of floating around in the cytoplasm, separate from the bacteria's chromosomes. The other prophages become part of the host cell's chromosome. They mix with the bacterial DNA and they're responsible for mediating this other type of transduction called specialized transduction. And so um, the, this strand just kind of lays latent until there's some sort of condition that stimulates it. And when it gets stimulated, it enters the lytic phase or the lytic cycle, and it begins producing a whole bunch of copies of itself and then that eventually causes the cell to lyse and then um, those are going to leave that host cell and attach themselves to other cells where they can then infect them and inject both the bacterial genetic material and the viral genetic material. Consequently, the prophages exits uh, and a few bacterial genes also leave, all right? Because it's kind of this, it's this mix, right? Um, this is significant because this is the way that genetic phenotypic characteristics such as antibiotic resistance, where we have our methicillin resistant Staph aureus and our vancomycin resistant enterococcus, um, 
this is how that resistance happens. And it's been found in strains such as Bacillus, Pseudomonas, Salmonella, um, Eschrichia, and Haemophilus. Another method that bacteria can use to transfer genetic information is through transformation. And there's two types of transformation, natural and artificial. Natural means it's occurring naturally um, uh, in the host, and artificial means we're doing it in a lab. All right, so let's talk about natural transformation first. Natural transformation is different because we saw with conjugation, the two cells join together and information is transferred from one to another, right? With transduction, bacteriophages were utilized to transfer that genetic material. With transformation, it's just a naked strand of DNA that's surrounded by this protective coat. And they think that this can happen sometimes when the bacterial cells are lysed and they die. And then there's these naked strands of DNA and they're released into the environment and that exposes them to other bacteriums that will then take up that fragment of DNA. And uh, scientists discovered this about 70 years ago and um, and so they they um, they looked at this process with Streptococcus, and what they observed was Streptococcus has these receptors on its surface, on its cell membrane that freely uh, that allows DNA to freely bind there, and then um, it changes the construct of the plasma membrane and that allows the DNA to come inside. And once it's inside, it eventually bumps into the cell's genetic material and then it combines with some matching material, some homologous genes. Through a series of reactions, this DNA gets incorporated into the cell's chromosomes. This just like blows my mind. Um, and then uh, lastly, the, it's most optimal when the donor and the recipient cells are really closely related. Um, and uh, this, the ability of these cell walls to allow these large fragments of DNA to enter is referred to as competence. And uh, so this doesn't occur very often in bacteria. They've only observed it in a few species, which includes Bacillus, Haemophilus, Neisseria, and then some strains of Staphylococcus and Streptococcus. Now let's talk about artificial transformation. This is where we get our genetic engineering from, where um, they're working with strands of DNA in the lab, and what this requires is the DNA to be handled outside of the cell and then returned to the inside of a living cell. And so there are several ways that they can do that, but they have to first determine the type of vector that's going to be best used to carry the DNA. And typically that's either a bacterial plasmid or, uh, or a virus, a bacteriophage, right? And so the vector needs to be able to replicate once it's inside the cell. That's a very important thing. And so the book gives the example of E. coli. And E. coli doesn't naturally transform, but they can treat it in a special way in the lab. And that is going to allow its plasma wall to become competent, quote unquote, and it is going to allow DNA to enter in. Now, another way they can do this um, is using electrical current. An electrical current is going to create pores in that cell membrane, which would allow the same thing to happen. Um, another way is by using a gene gun that literally shoots foreign DNA into some plant cells 
uh, they've tried it out on some plant cells um, because they have a really thick um, wall made of cellulose. And so the gene gun is necessary to um, genetically engineer different types of plants. And then lastly, um, there's a process called microinjection, and microinjection allows DNA to be directly injected into a cell, and this uses a small pipette. Genetic mutations occur when a base in the sequence of DNA is changed. And so now that segment is going to be different, and that is going to cause a, that gene to produce a different end product. Now, there can be three different types of um, occurrences. One, there could be, uh, it could be neutral or silent, and that change doesn't cause any type of domino effect or any change in the activity of the product that's going to be encoded. Um, it could also be lethal. Uh, if some sort of trait is completely lost. And then lastly, it could be beneficial. It could help the organism out, right? So different methods of mutation, two different types, missense and nonsense. And a missense mutation occurs inside a gene that codes for a particular type of protein. Remember, most genes code for proteins. And so what happens here is when the the um, messenger RNA codes a strand of DNA, a wrong base is coded, okay? And this means that when it gets transcribed, that a incorrect amino acid is going to be produced. With a nonsense mutation, there is the creation of a stop codon. So remember, um, when translation is occurring, the, um, the tRNA is going along every three bases is called a codon. Well, there are special stop codons. If a stop codon is at the wrong place, that is gonna mean that that protein isn't going to be, that amino acid isn't going to be built properly. It's not gonna be synthesized properly. Okay, so this is going to result in some sort of mutation. And this, uh, these mutations can be spontaneous, which means there was no type of mutagen uh, or mutation causing agent that they could identify. And so the cause is going to be unknown and that's referred to as spontaneous. And then there can be those mutations that are caused by mutagens. And some common ones, as I mentioned before, that were exposed to in surgery are various types of chemical agents, biological agents, and ionizing radiation. Mutagens are any agents that uh, cause genetic mutations. And uh, some that we're gonna talk about are chemical mutations, ionizing radiation, ultraviolet light, and biological mutagens uh, specific to the operating room. And then we'll talk about mutation rate. Chemical mutations. Chemical mutations uh, typically result in a frame shift mutation and that produces a counterbalancing of the true strands of DNA. So remember when the DNA splits and it gets copied, um, and then that copy is going to, um, those copies will uh, join back together, or those parts of the DNA rather will join back together um, when a frame shift occurs, there's going to be a space in one or both of those strands. And then when the strand is synthesized, one of those pairs or several of those pairs of nucleotide bases um, aren't going to be there. So they're either deleted or there's extra ones that are going to get inserted. And so an example of this is um, Benzopyrene, which is a chemical that is present in industrial smoke. Um, and uh, another example that is close to home for us is ethylene oxide 
or ETO, and it also causes a frame shift mutation, and it is that chemical sterilant that we use uh, in the um, um, sterile processing department to go ahead and process those items that cannot be processed through steam sterilization methods because they're heat sensitive. And as I said before, ETO um, is very toxic and it is uh, a proven uh, carcinogen. And because of that, most places don't use it anymore. Uh, polymethyl methacrylate is another example of a chemical mutagen that we're exposed to in surgery. Um, this is also called bone cement. Um, and it is also a proven carcinogen. It puts off very strong fumes when you mix it. Um, there is a, um, a suction like uh, evacuator that we use to try to um, pull away most of those fumes, but we still do inhale some of those fumes. Ionizing radiation is something else that we're exposed to in the operating room, whether it's fluoroscopy or x-ray, um, flat plate x-ray, that kind of thing. Um, it also comes from natural sources like the sun and ra other radioactive elements that are in soil or other things that are coming out of the earth. And uh, the reason that it is it causes mutations is because it leads to free radicals. And that means that there's these free electrons that are kind of floating around uh, or running around crazily, and they can combine with other bases in the DNA. And then this causes mistakes to occur uh, during DNA replication. Um, and something else that it can cause is... Um, uh, covalent bonds of the sugar phosphate molecules in the DNA to be broken. And then this causes breaks in the chromosomes. Um, ultraviolet light. Ultraviolet light um, is uh, um, a component of normal sunlight. Um, they're also using it in the operating rooms, some operating rooms to, to kill bacteria. So um, it is something that we're exposed to as well, and it can cause the formation of these uh, bonds between thymine uh, in the DNA chains called thymine dimers. And this also results in free radicals that can be dangerous. Some bacteria can produce enzymes called photoreactivating enzymes that help repair this damage, um, but others can't. And then some biological mutagens, um, laser plume. And you might have heard uh, Mrs. Braunbeck mentioning laser plume. And uh, when we are lasering um, genital warts due to the papilloma virus, particles of that go into the air. It's the same with bovi plume, but not... Um, Typically, we're using lasers for, for the papillomavirus, but there was a study that was conducted, um, and there were two GYN surgeons that had extensive exposure to laser plume because they were doing uh, numerous cervical ablation procedures uh, for HPV, and they actually developed that in their mouth and throat. Uh, they developed mouth and throat cancers. Um, and they linked it to these procedures that they were doing uh, for lasering HPV. So um, there is additional PPE that we can use and special suction devices to reduce our exposure. Um, and then lastly, the mutation rate. That's just how often a mutation is going to occur. Um, they don't occur very often. So typically that's represented by the power of 10, but it's a it's typically a negative number, like 10 minus 9 or 10 to the minus 12, whatever the case may be. There are several methods that they use in the laboratory to help identify mutants 
uh, mutant bacteria, uh, mutant strains of bacteria, uh, for example. Um, and the ones that we're going to talk about are direct selection, counter selection, replica plating, and self directed mutagenesis. So direct selection is uh, the isolation of antibiotic resistant mutant strains. And so this is basically a strain of bacteria smeared onto a petri dish, let's say containing penicillin, and then the, um, the medium contains penicillin. And then if there is any growth on there, it is going to be bacteria that are penicillin resistant. Counter selection is the opposite, where they're going to create two environmental conditions. One that prevents the growth of the desired mutant strain, and one that is used to kill the growing cells. Um, while the mutant cells can't proliferate, they are able to survive the conditions that were used to kill the non-mutated cells. So this results in a large percentage of mutant cells among the surviving population, and this helps them to isolate those. Counter selection is also used to isolate and study oxytrophic mutant strains. These are strains that possess a nutritional requirement that was not possessed by the parent. Uh, that is known as an oxytroph. So um, humans have multiple oxytrophs, and uh, an example of that is that we don't have the ability to produce essential, some essential amino acids and some essential vitamins. And so we need to get those from our environment or the food that we eat. Replica plating is uh, also used to detect mutated strains of bacteria. And uh, the example that the book gives is working with E. coli. Um, and what they do is they have multiple auger plates and those are half inoculated with streptomycin antibiotic and half inoculated just with regular nutrient auger, no antibiotic. And they take a piece of cloth and they are uh, stretch it across a block and they're going to use that as a stamper, like a stamp press. And so the specimen that they're going to be analyzing and testing is incubated in a petri dish and is allowed to grow, and that's called the master dish. And then they're going to press that block uh, with the velveteen into that master dish, and they're going to stamp it onto a prepared solid auger petri dish. Um, one with streptomycin, an antibiotic, let's say, and one without and then they're going to watch and see what happens. And um, if, uh, if there is a situation where there is uh, negative growth on the antibiotic plate, uh, they're going to take that velveteen um, and they're going to press it with a new cloth one more time, and they're going to put it onto an untreated auger plate without antibiotics, and they're going to see if anything grows out. Okay, they didn't see anything growing, but they're going to carry the test one step further. Um, and if they do see growth on that very last plate, then that is going to demonstrate that there is some type of mutant strain of E. coli. And then the last one, self-directed mutagenesis, um, is related to uh, recombinant DNA technology. And so this is going to evolve selection, and it allows the researcher to mutate a specific gene on purpose. So they're going to um, artificially mutate a specific gene uh, to create a desired uh, mutant strain. We're going to close this out by talking about the use of mutants in lab screening tests. So they used to um, use animals 
to test things to see if they were mutagenic or carcinogenic, and that is um, expensive, it's time consuming, it's controversial, and so there is a test that um, was created called the Ames test, and it is a um, faster, less expensive procedure for testing to see if things are carcinogenic, and it does not involve animal testing. However, it does evolve, involve macerated rat liver, and the macerated rat livers are treated with the substance that we think might be carcinogenic, and um, if the test is negative, then the chemical is more than likely harmless. Um, the book indicates that 90% of the chemicals tested that demonstrate mutagenic characteristics using the AIM test are subsequently shown to be carcinogenic. So that tells me that this AIMS test is pretty effective at determining whether or not specific chemicals cause cancer. So this brings us to the end of chapter seven. I hope that it was helpful and uh, thank you for listening.